And I just want to say thank you to everybody who's been supporting the market so over the last year. It's not been an easy time and we've been so glad that we've been able to, to keep going. Wonderful. Thank you, Cheryl, okay. and, uh, and welcome. All right, now we're going to hear from our next local legend. So we've got Nick here from Bagnell Farms. I'll let Nick talk about it, but he produces wonderful heritage breed livestock. And uh, I hear is, a, is an excellent chef, an ex-chef. Is that right, Nick? A long time ago. <laughs> We're in good company. I believe so. But, well, the, the pleasure is all mine. It's, um, it's you guys that are taking it to the next level. So uh, tell, us, tell us about the farm and, um, and what you guys are doing out there. Okay, so... Uh, like you just touched on, uh, food's a ma been a massive part of my life. It's um, I've been involved with food right since I've been, say, kind of 12 years of age. Um, now, we, we, we're back no farm is a farm of just under, well, around about 180 acres. Uh, we kind of have 120 acres of that designated pasture. And on there, we breed our Red Ruby Devon and our Jacob Sheep. Um, and we have uh, an additional kind of circa 60 acres of... Uh, Woodland, which we have our Iron Age pig breed, and they're forage aware, uh, and are, are happy as uh, content in mud, and you name it, they love it. <laughs> um, the three breeds that we do breed uh, we are all kind of the bordering on the rare breeds. They're not they're not designated rare breeds, but we believe in um, farming local traditional kind of animals. So that's what we do. Uh, the Red Ruby Devon breed, the cattle, it's a pedigree breed. We show our animals at uh, a lot of the agricultural shows. We regularly win awards, breed champion, overall champion, you name it. it it's something that we're very, very passionate about doing. And uh, Mark, who's my brother-in-law, and Lisa, they are absolutely fanatical about the way that the animals are brought up and shown and tread. Uh, with the utmost respect uh, and that's what we try and do um several years ago we kind of got involved with lfm uh, london fibers market and we were kind kind kindly invited to sell our wares through the markets um and it's kind of grown since then really the farm the farm's taken on a whole new uh vibe uh we we, we deal a, a lot now with kind of farm local farm shops we sell our meat through there but our main, our main business is selling through uh, the London farmers markets. And that's kind of grown, like I say, it's grown over the last few years. Uh, we're now doing three markets on the London farmers markets where we originally just did the one. And um, it's just getting bigger and bigger as, as we speak. Um, and, and really without, without the support of LFM and especially the people of London, the, you know, the people of London, uh, we, we, I don't think we'd, we'd, we'd survive. Uh, so we owe a lot to LFM and the people. But the, the, the breeds of animals that we do, uh, we're kind of we're kind, we're kind of passionate about how they're raised, how they're butchered, how they're presented, how they're sold. And none of our animals are, are, are bred for commercial aspects. They're all bred. The, the, the bred kind of purely for meat and the flavour of the meat. Uh, and we hope that that comes across in, in, in what you guys do and the general public that buy offers, you know, we, we, we ate it when somebody gets, you know, we love to sell our meat with passion and that's what we do. So hopefully it's all in the cooking. Over to you guys. Amazing. Thank you. It's been a pleasure cooking with um, with some of your products, even up in earlier weeks, but then today cooking the, the brisket, it's been amazing. So wow. good. I can't wait for you to open the oven door and I can actually smell it. I know, yes. It's going to be good. <laughs> Just pass it through the laptop and to everyone. That would be great. I'm waiting for this. <laughs> All right. And then last but not least, we have Ali from Bramble Type Farms, of Fruit Farms. Um, take it away. Tell us all about your amazing orchard. And I would love to hear specifically about the mushroom room because we're going to be cooking with some of your amazing mushrooms i'm so excited hi thanks ben um yeah my name's ellie i'm one of the runners of the business of the bramble thai fruit farm with my partner stein um 
We have 45 acres of mixed top fruits, apples and pears, berries, um, some outdoor vegetables, and chicken or eggs. Um, there were some scratching around here, but I think they're gone just now. Uh, and a new addition in the last few years has been mushrooms, uh, particularly exotic mushrooms, um, oyster mushrooms, um, shiitake, namiko, lion's mane, and we're trying two new ones now, maitake and shimishi. Uh, these we're growing indoors in special mushroom rooms that we've just designed ourselves and are at the moment still trying to build. Um, but so far the process is going really well and uh, it's really helped um, our business breach what we call the hungry gap between crops of um, fruits and vegetables as we do only grow outside and not in controlled tunnels with the uh, heaters. Um, one big part of our farm is that it is organic uh, and we really emphasize to have a sustainable farm. Um, where we incorporate, uh, well, we try and keep a closed farm organism where everything is um, feeding itself in a way and becomes a healthy, balanced farm. That's one of our biggest aims. So as you will see behind me in this, this is the pear orchard which is that I'm sitting in now, underneath the pears now are these blocks of, uh, this is the mushroom, what the mushroom has grown on the substrate. So it's actually the the waste from after the mushroom and the wood, which will decompose now and go back into the soil, become organic matter and feed the pear trees and grow the pears. Uh, we, what do we, we sell probably 90 to 95% of all of the produce uh, directly at the farmers markets in London. Um, originally, my partner had sold to supermarkets but slowly moved away from that for many different reasons um, but one thing we really enjoy about this is like Cheryl said in the beginning that we have full control of you know what we sell who we sell it to and that communication uh, is there without the middleman uh, we also process a lot of our own foods here so we make juices from the apples which aren't perfect uh, with vegetables that are wonky and unsellable, we might um, make fermented vegetables, sauerkrauts and things like that. Uh, so we really try and utilize everything that we have and, uh, and our customers also really appreciate the, the diversity and what you can have at different times of the year um, through that processing. Yeah, I think that's about all from me. Amazing, thank you so much. And I must say, if you're only still learning how to how to cook mushrooms, uh, pr produce mushrooms, I think you're doing a very good job already. I can't wait to see what the final product looks like because these are fantastic. So excited! Right. <coughs> All right. Well, again, thank you so much. Welcome, uh, welcome along, and um, let's let's get cooking, shall we? All right. So. I'm going to be very ambitious and I'm going to try to cook a brisket and condiments and dessert all in the next 45 minutes or so. So um, let's get started. So first of all, we're going, to, we're going to cook this wonderful brisket. So Nick has been generous enough to provide us with this absolutely amazing cut um, from his Ruby Red Devons. So for those of you that haven't cooked with brisket before, it's, um, it's found on the front front lower part of, of the cow uh, and it's a working muscle which means that it's been utilized quite a lot throughout its life and the result of that is that it has really really strong uh, connective tissue and muscle but also has really great intermuscular fat and good flavor that goes through the meat. For these sorts of cuts you absolutely want to do a low and slow technique which is what we're going to be doing here. So I've just got a, um, an oven safe pot here and I'm going to heat that up and we're going to start by sealing off or searing this, this meat so we can get some really nice caramelization and some good color straight away into the food. Got a little bit of salt, got a bing, and we're going to put it straight in to our 
Okay. So, um, Ruby read, Devin, I've done a little bit of research, and Nick, please chime in if you've, um, if you've got more stuff to add. But it's a, it's a wonderful breed, and one of the main reasons that I love it is because it's a, it's a natural forager. And so, I'm not sure exactly what happens on your farm, Nick, but um, I've seen that around the place they go and they, they forage on all the different types of grasses and weeds and wonderful foods that are naturally found on the farm. And That's as a right. result, the, the, you get... The, what we call, the what we call a hidey breed. Sorry, say that again? Sorry, it, the what we call a hidey breed. Yes, yes, absolutely. So they would forage with the grass, hay, haylage, wildflowers. That would be their typical uh, nutrition. Absolutely. And so I always think back, I'm not sure if anyone's read uh, the author Michael Pollan, but he, he talks about this idea, you are what you eat, but you are what you eat eats too. And so the, the food that you know our livestock are eating does impart flavour and nutrition into that final product. And if you think about it, if a, if a cow's eating, you know, just sort of bought in grain and, um, and sort of a two-dimensional diet, then it means you end up with two-dimensional flavor and two-dimensional nutritional value. But um, when you've got wonderful grazing animals and foraging animals like the ruby red devon, then you end up with this really fantastic flavor at the end and, and more nutrition for us. Um, I also love this cut because it promotes... Uh, Sort of whole whole animal eating, and so typically, you know, the most popular cuts are what we call prime cuts. So they're sort of the eye fillet, the ribeye, and the sirloin. And often um, these sorts of uh, secondary cuts aren't as highly valued, uh, which I think is is starting to change now. We see more and more people coming back to especially the sort of low and slow cooking technique, which is fantastic. But it's um, it's a fantastic way to um, to promote that that whole value and providing better value back to our local producers by, by changing up exactly what sort of cuts we are eating with. Yeah. Alright, so that started to get a bit of caramelization on the top there, hopefully you can see. This is obviously not a professional kitchen, but we're going to do our best to make this look as professional as possible. So, into you've, this... You've got, a bottle, you've got a bottle of red wine there, so you must be professional. That's coming up very shortly, don't you worry about that. Um, so, what we're going to do essentially is, is called a braise, and I'm sure many of you have done this before. Um, the idea is that we submerge it uh, two-thirds of the way up with liquid, and then we cook it low and slow. What we're going to do is we're going to add this holy trinity of vegetables, the, uh, what is known in the culinary world as a mirepoix, it is uh, onions, carrot, and celery. And it is the three vegetables that make up a base of a vegetable stock. So if you were to just put this with water, then you make a stock. What we're gonna do is drop that straight in. And essentially what we're doing is we're making the stock fresh in the pot with the meat. And so as that cooks over a period of four hours at 160 degrees, the, all of the vegetables are going to go into the flavour of the water and that water is then going to flavour into the meat. We do have some red wine that's going to add a little bit of richness to the sauce and again make that really nice. I've, um, I've gone with the Shiraz Cabernet which has got a good body to it um, because this, this beef brisket can stand up to quite a bit of flavour. So we're going to put in around about a cup, two cups. I don't typically measure too much, of it, but I will have a recipe for, uh, for everyone at the end, I promise. Then we put in our water. And so the idea is, like I said, we only want to come up with the water around about two-thirds of the way up. Obviously, the more water you add, the more you're diluting the flavour that's coming from the mirepoix. Uh, but you don't want to put in so little that it might end up drying out. So around about two thirds of the way up, I find is the, is the best level. Just got one more person. All right, and then, so the next step after this, is so these pots are, um, are pretty good for, uh, for keeping the steam in. Just gonna find the lid. They do fit quite snugly. But um, you don't want to lose too much liquid through this braising process. So what you can do is uh, make what is known as 
a piece of baking paper. So what you want to do here is fold it in half, fold it in half again, take the end corner that is folded and then fold it again and then fold it again. Keep folding it until you get a nice kind of spear that's pointed around this uh, the center of the paper. Pop it halfway into the middle here so that the, the tip is in the middle of the pot and your finger is marking where the edge of the pot is. Take your scissors, snip the edge, snip the edge on that, and then lo and behold, you end up with a circular piece of paper that you can pop on top. That's going to help to keep a lot of that liquid inside and stop it from evaporating out too quickly. Alright, lid goes on, and now for the semi-dangerous kitchen rearranging. We're going to pull this out, and we're going to put this up. So that goes into the oven for, like I said, four hours at 160 degrees. And uh, when you pull that out, it's going to be the most succulent, juicy, fall off the bone, delicious cut of meat. Um, the brisket is absolutely full of fat, full of flavor, full of that really great connective tissue uh, that makes for, for a, wonderful, a wonderful braise or a wonderful roast. Especially when you buy it from Nick. All right, so next up we are going to do our uh, wild garlic salsa verde. So a salsa verde is just a fancy name for a green sauce. It's kind of like a pesto. Uh, it's got similar ingredients and it's a really, a really wonderful, really versatile uh, condiment to have around. Wild garlic, in my opinion, is, is one of the best success stories of, of seasonal food and of local food. No, in Australia, we, um, we, don't really, we don't really eat this very much. We still consider it a wheat. And um, some of the mo more forward-thinking chefs are starting to incorporate it into their menus, but, um, but they still think about it as a wheat. And um, what I love since coming over here to the UK is that you can get this available, obviously when it's in season through spring, um, at all of the farmer's markets around. And it's celebrated and loved, and everyone seems to get on board with this, this amazing thing. And it reminds me of, um, of this saying that uh, weeds, are, weeds are, are good plants with bad press agents. The idea that, you know, actually weeds, are, a lot of weeds are edible. They've been used historically for culinary and medicinal purposes. Um, weeds are often really nutritious for you because they're quite hardy. Uh, they can withstand, you know, the wild environment. So that ends up being uh, more nutritionally dense for us. And um, incorporating more seasonal Weeds into our diet is a fantastic way uh, to, to you know, support, support local. Lucky enough to get some Yorkshire, and yes, apparently it was similar to the lily, yes, yes, okay, so that is true that there is, um, there's a similar plant that is uh, native, but it's also toxic. So make sure that you want to look out for the right one. Um, the characteristics are the, the stem and the flower that comes off the top and uh, and the nice the nice wide leaves but of course you can always just go to the London farmers market and purchase those wonderful wild garlic as you see it all right so this is a very simple and a very quick recipe what we want to do is um, I'm actually going to keep this little flower for a nice garnish at the end that's gonna be fun um, I'm just gonna roughly chop this wild garlic Stems and all, I don't mind a bit of garlic stem into, into my green sauce. It um, can be quite a pungent and punchy flavour, and so I like to balance it out with a, uh, with a set of other wonderful, delicious ingredients, which include some fresh chives, some lemon zest and lemon juice, some grated parmesan cheese and some capers. And so all of these ingredients come together to make this wonderful green sauce, which is um, vibrant, fresh, 
and uh, just a, a wonderful condiment to have uh, in your in your fridge or uh, or in your freezer. What I what I tend to do, especially when it's in season, is to make big batches of this sort of sauce and then freeze it down either into small containers. I've even frozen it down into ice cube trays before, so you can pop out different ice cubes. Just utilize sort of one or two portions uh, as you go, and that's a great way to to extend that season. Um, as Ali was saying, across across the whole year. And uh, pesto is amazing with wild garlic. I absolutely want to try that. That sounds sounds so good. And so we want to put in oil, around about a quarter of a cup. You really just want to put in enough oil so that it can it can turn into a nice sauce and just come together come together nicely. It does depend on um, on how much lemon juice and, and other liquids you put in, but it's um, it's good to good to feel it out. Now, the big and the important thing about making this sauce as delicious as possible is to not try to blend it too much. So when you blend things, um, you create friction, obviously, and friction creates heat, and heat breaks down chlorophyll, which is the green pigment that you find in plants. And so if you blitz it too much, then you can end up making your sauce go a little bit sort of dark green or even brown. And so what you want to do is just lightly pulse it so that it comes together, but, um, but it doesn't turn too, too dark. You see that? That is it. Actually, I might just pop in. I've got a. It's looking a little bit, a little bit dry. So this is kind of like a nice. This is almost like a pesto consistency, actually, without the nuts. But I want to make it just a little bit looser so that it can uh, be a nice drizzle on top of, uh, on top of this wonderful beef brisket. Pop that on. There we go, that's looking better. And so, get that spoon. You'll be able to see that we've got this, this wonderful sauce, which is just a lovely, lovely garlic lovely kind of onion flavor from the chive you've got the capers which are creating this nice little bit of acidity as does the lemon and that parmesan really kind of mellows it out gives it that salty sort of umami flavor which is um which is just a, a super delicious condiment so we will put that there and like i said this is a, a great recipe to be able to freeze down you can utilize it all throughout the year and um and make the most of that uh, that garlic season while it is uh, while it's available. All right. So I a couple of couple of quick questions. So do you recommend using a mortar and pestle? You can use a mortar and pestle, absolutely. Um, if you were doing that, I would start by chopping the um, the wild garlic and the chives quite finely, just so that you don't want to work it too much, so that it um, so that it again loses some of that really fresh green vibrancy. I found these sort of um, these quick little little blitzes, these little machines are, are really good for, for doing the job um, or some sort of blender, kind of a smoothie machine will absolutely do the, do the job as well so that's fantastic. Alright let us move on to step number three and I'm very excited about this step because I don't know why but mushrooms just make me very happy and these mushrooms are seriously some of the best that I have seen. Let me tell you all about them. And Ali, please jump in if, um, if you would like to, to um, add more information. So we have here an amazing array of mushrooms. So first up we have this guy here. This is a king oyster mushroom. This is well known for its quite meaty texture. It, um, it's great on a barbecue and you can cook it and it can stand up really well to quite a bit of cooking. 
So it's quite a hardy, a hardy beast. Next up we have our shiitakes. So this is a very popular mushroom used um, in Asian cuisine. It's uh, quite a pungent, quite strong, earthy flavor. You might have seen uh, shiitakes being dried and used in sort of traditional Japanese stocks and sauces, that sort of thing. Uh, but can absolutely be cooked fresh as well. These little guys are super fun. Namako. Am I saying that right, Ali? Yeah, yeah. Namako. Um, they kind of, they kind of almost look like um, kip mushrooms in the sense that they're, they're this kind of nice sort of light, light brown color. Um, they have this sort of natural gelatinousness to them. And so when you cook them, they sort of come together, especially when you cook them uh, with other mushrooms all together, they, um, they create this really nice sauce, which is wonderful. We have our regular oyster mushrooms, but there's nothing regular about these mushrooms. I think they're fantastic. These ones here are, are bright yellow, and then we have uh, our other normal oysters. And then, last but not least, probably my favorite, is, uh, is this. The lion's mane. Now it looks like the mane of a lion. Um, it is this sort of bulbous, almost kind of shaggy looking fungi, um, which I have heard tastes a little bit like lobster. It's got this sort of flavor and texture of, um, of beautiful lobster. And so I'm very excited to, um, to get into that. So what I'm going to do with this technique, with this cooking, is very simple. I'm going to pan fry um, and add a little bit of butter and a little bit of tarragon. The challenging thing about mushrooms is that they all cook at different times. These guys here are going to take, the, the king oysters are going to take a, a, a minute or two, whereas the, um, the fresh oyster mushrooms won't take very long at all, only 30 seconds or so. And so, the way that we get around that from, uh, from a cooking perspective is to put on the, uh, the big kind of chunky hardier mushrooms first, cook their butt first, and then just look at the inside of that. Such an amazing, such an amazing food, isn't it? It's so cool. Um, so we're going to put that on first and then we're going to add the, uh, the fresher mushrooms uh, closer towards the end. So in this first round, I'm going to put in the king, uh, the king oyster, king brown, uh, the lion's mane, and the shiitakes because they uh, they do like a little bit of cooking. And then towards the end, I'm going to put on the namako and the the fresh oysters. So, Ali, as I'm just finishing off this chopping, I would love for you to tell us about the the mushroom room and how you produce these. Okay, um, so the, the mushroom spawn is inoculated onto all of these particular varieties, onto hardwoods, mm -hmm. uh, so oak, birch, alder, apple trees, pears, all those sorts of hardwoods. Um, I know you make a very fine wood chip from, from your prunings or your cuttings mm -hmm. and then you would mix that in with the mushroom spawn possibly a bit of water mm -hmm. um, and then you want to compress that into uh, what we use bags um, I have at some point to use tubs as well uh, and then they are incubated mm -hmm. for different periods of time depending on the type of mushroom um, and once the mycelium has really run through and taken over that wood and is feeding off it um, you would then either open up the bag completely, like the shiitake we take it off, and it's just the block of mushroom uh, that the shiitake grow out of. Um, some of the other ones, like the oyster, you would make small holes to encourage them to grow out of a particular place. Mm -hmm. um, and we do this in uh, just, we've just built some, they almost look like fridges, so just fridge panels, insulated spaces. Um, and we've built our own heat exchangers um, okay. because mushrooms like particular temperatures and humidity. Um, but one very important thing is that they need clean air uh, to grow. So when they grow in the wild, obviously, they're, they're getting that fresh air. And in a controlled environment, um, 
they're, they're giving off a lot of CO2 and they need a lot of oxygen. So we're circulating that air um, in this space. Uh, they're not dark rooms. A lot of people think the mushrooms are grown completely in the dark, mm -hmm. where some button mushrooms are, like the white button mushrooms are grown in the dark, and that's what makes them so white. Mm -hmm. um, all of our ones are quite colourful, and they're grown in semi-light conditions, uh, which gives them their colour. Yeah. yeah. So cool. So yeah. excited. We, um, we've been, in my household, we've been eating these mushrooms almost every week, coming down to our local Queen's Park Farmer's Market to... Um, to purchase this and it's um it's been such a treat it's great all right so the cooking technique that we're going to do here like i said is a simple sort of pan fry but what i recommend we do is try not to move it around too much try to resist the urge to uh to you know to kind of toss them around and move them around now the reason for that is because what i find a lot is that when you're cooking mushrooms and, and you do mix them around, they end up sort of bruising, they end up sort of losing a lot of their texture and in, in going quite soft. And so if you can resist the urge to, uh, to shake it around and uh, let it sit directly onto the bottom of the pan into the oil, that's going to create a really nice caramelization on the on the base on the on the contact surface with the pan and then the heat is going to travel up through and just very gently cook the mushrooms all the way through it's quite a um, quite a gentle sort of cooking technique uh, where you get nice color on one side but that residual heat sort of comes through and cooks it all the way through so that's starting to get a, a good bit of smoke, a good bit of colour. So let's pop in the, uh, the fresh ones. And like I said, I want to just cook this for, for around about one to two minutes, getting a, getting a good bit of colour. I also have my old friend tarragon. I just find that tarragon and mushrooms go, uh, go amazingly well together. So I'm just going to sprinkle that on top and uh, and pop that down. Now as I was preparing for this and I was thinking through, you know, this, this is a cooking workshop about seasonality, right? And I was like, Ben, you do realize that it's spring, not autumn, when the, when the mushrooms come into season, what's going on? And then uh, looking into, into your amazing, into mushroom growing rooms and uh and like you say coming across that hunger gap and providing delicious uh mushrooms for for people is it all year round that you're able to grow grow those mushrooms ali that's the aim that's the aim yeah yeah it's very cool and it sort of it throws the the idea of seasonality a little bit on its head in the sense that you know what we really want to do is create diverse food systems that are good for the people and good for the planet and um, although this, you know, quote unquote, might not be seasonal by nature's standard, it absolutely hits the mark on a lot of those other goals and uh, uh, ecological and, and social goals back to the community. So it's a, it's a fantastic thing. All right, now we're going to drop in some butter because mushrooms and butter are again, very good friends. And again, if we can resist the urge to, uh, to uh, play around with this too much. Let that butter sort of foam up, turn into this wonderful ingredient, which, uh, which was known as Bernoisette. Uh, Nick from his uh, culinary days will, uh, will know all about this wonderful godly liquid. Uh, essentially, if you, if you cook butter until you uh, sort of caramelize the whey, the natural uh, whey in the, in the butter, then, oh sorry, the curds, you caramelize the curds, then you flavor the rest of the butter with this almost kind of nutty, caramelized, really delicious uh, buttery sauce. Uh, in French, Bernoisette literally translates to hazelnut butter. And so it's sort of, um, it's like this kind of, yeah, this nutty, this nutty, delicious butter. Alright, and now is the time that we can start to move it around and just see what we have underneath. 
And so, guys, I wish you were here to be able to smell this amazing mushroom and, and buttery goodness. And hopefully you can see that we've get, we're getting some very nice caramelization on, uh, on just one side. And on the other side, you're seeing some really nice texture. The mushrooms are holding up really beautifully. And, um, and you're kind of getting the best of both worlds here. Of course, if you like to cook your mushrooms a little bit more, then you can absolutely do that. But for me, that is absolutely perfect. And of course, the mushrooms will continue to cook as they sit here in this bowl. From our old friend Residual Heat, he will uh, continue to cook once, the, once it's all gone. But um, that there... Excuse me is uh, absolutely delicious. You should be able to see there this steaming, delicious bowl of mushrooms, which is going to be an amazing garnish to, uh, to put over our wonderful braised beef brisket. Very exciting. All right, how are we doing for time? We're doing not bad, actually. We're getting through. All right, now pushing through. Next up, let's move on to dessert, shall we? Shall we talk about a little dessert? Okay. So, um, first of all, let me introduce you to possibly one of the cutest fruits that I have ever come across. This here is the... Now, say, forgive me if I'm doing it wrong, but the Geyser Wilderman? The Geyser Wilderman? Geyser Wilderman. Geyser Wilderman. This is the cutest, tiniest little pear that you will ever see. It is um, a wonderful variety that uh, comes from the 1850s in the Netherlands and it's, uh, and it's an absolutely beautiful cooking pear. I hadn't actually cooked with these pears before today and, um, and when I picked them up yesterday from, uh, from, the, from the Swiss Cottage Farmers Market I was so, so pleased and so delighted to be able to, to try them out. I found them to, um, to have some really fantastic uh, texture. It holds its shape really well through the cooking process and it just has a, a really wonderful mellow flavor. So I'm very happy with that. Let me, uh, let me cut this open for you and show you what we've got on the inside. So the way that I prepped these is I just popped off the ends, cut it in half to reveal tiny little inner core. Now I do understand, Ali, that um, you guys don't actually take out the core when you make it, is that right? No, uh, so we do poach them in apple juice, just exactly like you've done there, cut in half. Nice. Uh, with the skin on, quite simple, yeah. Absolutely. So I ended up just popping out that little bit. And uh, Here's some that I prepared earlier, so you don't have to sit me sit here watching me uh, cut pears in half for the next 20 minutes. And um, so what I've done here is I've I've um, I've just cut them in half, top off the ends. I have taken out the cores, um, and I've sat them in acidulated water, which is just a fancy name for water with lemon in it. Uh, the lemon helps to stop the oxidization process as you're prepping it. So when you finish, you end up with a really uh, vibrant and, um, and bright uh, product. So for this technique, we're going to do a, uh, a sort of a bottling. So we'll pop that in there. The idea is that we want to put a good amount of fruit into our jar. These jars have been sterilized beforehand. Uh, by boiling them in a pot of water for at least five minutes and then allowing it to air dry and that just kills off any bacteria that you might find. And then the second fruit that's going into this wonderful crumble is our old friend rhubarb. Delicious, nutritious, this is, um, this is a new season rhubarb. And you can tell that it's got, um, it's got quite a bit of green as well as, as, well as the red. Rhubarb is one of my favorite foods to cook with. 
It's um, it brings a really great uh, natural astringency. This kind of and when you cook it with with uh, sugar, then it, it just creates this this wonderful flavor, as I'm sure all of you know. Um, fun fact: rhubarb is actually a vegetable. Did did anyone else know that? I only found that out recently. Doesn't really matter for all intents and purposes. It, you know, put it in a pie, but that's uh, that's what it is. And so for this, what I've done is I uh, just chopped it into lengths and then just literally in half, just like so. And so we can pop this into our other sterilized jar. And here's some other ones that I prepared earlier. Handy. And uh, top that in just like that. So let us prepare the, uh, the poaching liquid for this. So the poaching liquid that I use is, um, is very simple. It is a three parts water, two parts sugar, and one part cider vinegar. So this is, um, it's almost, it's, it is, it's almost like a pickling mixture, but it's a little bit heavier on the sugar than I would normally do. I really like to add the vinegar because, um, for a few reasons, it makes it last a bit longer. Um, it brings that really nice acidity to the fruit. And um, often I'm using it, uh, cooking it with other dishes such as the crumble. And it just uh, it just makes makes everything taste really delicious. I have um, understand that chefs do like quite acidic food, so if you prefer to have your fruit uh, a little bit on the sweet side as opposed to the acidic side, then I recommend doing a 50% water, 50% sugar with just a little bit of, of vinegar. Uh, the apple cider vinegar on this is um, is quite nice and mellow as well, and can be can be used uh, quite liberally. All right, so while that's coming up to the boil, all this time I've had this uh, sneaky pot at the back simmering away. And so the cooking technique is we, we put the fruit directly into the jars, we make a hot pickling liquid, and we pour that directly into the jars. We close the lid, and then we put it into the pot of boiling water, and we let it cook uh, for essentially as long as it needs. This is a really great um, cooking technique for a couple of reasons. One is that it allows you to have really good control over how much you are cooking uh, the fruit. So for the rhubarb, I only really recommend cooking it for five to ten minutes after you put in the hot liquid. Whereas for the pears, uh, that would take it, take it takes around about an hour at least, an hour twenty to get nice and soft. And so by doing it this way, I can just pop it into the, into the water, take one out when it's ready, take the other one out a little bit after that, so it's really convenient. The other really good benefit, of course, is that once, once you have uh, sort of done this bottling technique, you can take it out, and these jars are essentially pasteurized. As long as everything's sterilized and everything's sealed properly, then these can stay out in a cold larder, um, away from direct sunlight for six months to a year and uh, which means you can again have access to this wonderful seasonal produce all throughout the year which is a, a really fantastic thing. I absolutely love preserving food. Um, I do a couple of, a couple of cooking workshops where I'm all about preserving and pickling and fermenting and I, I really really love it. One of the, um, one of the things I always ask in these sorts of workshops is, you know, put your, put your hands up if you've ever done any preserving before. And um, typically around about a quarter of the people put up their hand. And then I say, put your hands up if you have a refrigerator in your house. And then they all sheepishly put their hands up and they're like, well, you're all preserving food through the power of temperature control. And, um, and so, I love this idea that you can you can um, make these wonderful seasonal foods last for longer by adjusting the temperature, by cooling things down, by heating them up, by adjusting the pH, so by adding acid or by fermenting foods using a lacto-fermentation process. 
Uh, if you remove water from the situation by drying it out, dehydrating or by adding salt, then you can extend the shelf life. And then uh, oxygen is the other thing that um, bad bacteria need to grow. And so by reducing oxygen, by putting it into a sealed jar or by backpacking those foods, then you can make your food last, last a lot longer. And they often taste really delicious. Anyone who's done any sort of fermenting before uh, will know that it's some of the most delicious uh, foods as well as being very, very good for you. It's uh, very, very delicious. All right, so that is almost there. While that is heating up, what I am going to do is I'm going to whip up this uh, crumble in the next seven minutes. It's going to be amazing. So the crumble recipe, very simple. Uh, you know, everyone's got a classic crumble. It's, uh, it's always a combination of some flour, some fat, and some sugar. And so for this, for this particular recipe, what I'm using is uh, buckwheat flour. Absolutely love buckwheat flour. It's, uh, it's really nutritious for you. So it's got heaps of protein, heaps of fiber. Um, it's gluten-free. So if, if, you're, if you're not into the gluten, then it's a good option. Uh, and also buckwheat is a really great crop that, um, that can contribute so uh, health back to the soil. So it's kind of known as a, as a green manure crop. And so when you plant it, you can take nitrogen from the air and fix it back down into the soil. And so it's a, it's a fantastic crop to, to have as part of your local food system. So this has come up to the boil, so I'm going to pour that on. Hopefully I've made the right amount. Almost perfect, there you go. Just like I bought one. And then, as I said, close it up. Pop it into the pot of boiling water. It's kind of hard to see from this orientation, but you have to trust me that there's, uh, there's boiling water in here. And, uh, and so the rhubarb will take 10 minutes until it's ready. There's already a, a, good, amount of, um, a good amount of heat that is going to be cooking that rhubarb immediately. But, um, so 10 minutes and then for the pears, around about an hour. All right, so back to the crumble. We have uh, butter, of course. And then I like to make, um, with my crumbles, I like to add a nice bit of texture, some good nuts some seeds, so I've just got a blended mix of, uh, of nuts here, some sesame seeds, some pumpkin seeds, and a few currants as well. I quite like, you know, when, uh, when you bind it all together and you make this, um, this delicious crunchy crust on the top of your crumble, and you've got that dried fruit in there as well, it's, um, it's absolutely delicious. And then uh, for our sugar, I've got demerara sugar. Now this is a great sugar for um, for being able to uh, add a good bit of texture and a good bit of crunch to uh, to your crumble, and um, and can just add some really nice flavour going through. So now I'm going to sit here and massage this butter into this bowl, which is probably too small for the job. Have I got a larger bowl? Let's try this one. And uh, yeah, so like I said, buckwheat is a good option. Have uh, love to hear some of your crumble recipes. Has anyone got any great, uh, great crumble innovations that they've um, able to share with the group? Love to, love to hear about that. I always keep some crumble mix in the freezer. Yes. Yeah, Stand by. Oh, mm. perfect! Absolutely. You never know when you might need an emergency crumble. This exactly. Is, this is and actually way. freezing helps the texture. Okay, it does it. Okay, I haven't I haven't heard that one before. That's cool. All right, excuse me for ten seconds while I just quickly wash my hands. Just talk amongst yourselves. While you're doing that, Ellie, do you want to explain what the hungry gap is? Because some people might not know what it is. Um. Yeah. Well, the time between. Well, if you think a lot of the foods are, are grown from springtime, harvested over the summer and the autumn months, and then you've got some winter vegetable crops, 
and then between the months of usually March, April, May, those are the three months that I would call uh, the hungry gap where there's very few crops that are growing, um, that time where you're preparing your land and also we haven't found, well, to, to have the fresh produce um, available then. So there might be some herbs and things, unless you can do it in very, very controlled environments. But even in greenhouses and tunnels with them, um, you know, we get the early lettuces coming soon uh, because they've managed to heat them to propagate the seeds. Uh, for anybody growing outdoors, that'll be, you know, the end of May uh, before you'd have any new season produce, uh, whereas all of the vegetables will have, the root vegetables from the previous season um, will, yeah, will have finished. Great summary. <laughs> Very good summary. All right, so once again, here are some of these beautiful fruits that I have prepared earlier. So hopefully you can see that the pear has held its shape absolutely beautifully. Still got a little bit of texture, but nice and uh, squeezable and um, absolutely delicious. A wonderful natural flavor. I'm going to make a little petite crumble. A crumble for one but probably that one will be my girlfriend and so top it in what I like to do is just put in just a little bit of the liquid that's sort of been uh, had all of the flavor of those of those wonderful fruits uh, sort of built into the into that sauce so we don't want to waste any of that then we take our excellent crumble mix and liberally pop it on top And now what I've found is that with this, with this particular recipe, and I just saw a question, yes, we will be sending around recipes. I'll get them out to you tomorrow, absolutely. What I've found is that the butter in this sets really nicely into a beautiful crisp. Something about the buckwheat, which, um, which just holds its shape really nicely, and you get this kind of dig through and, um, and delicious bite, which is fantastic. So I cook this for 40 minutes at 180 degrees. And, uh, and it ends up coming out as this delicious, crunchy, soft, juicy, some of the juices from that fruit kind of, kind of peaks up over the side and it is uh, absolutely wonderful. All right, now, through the power of live television, I will transport you all to the future. Are you ready? So now we are going into the future half an hour and we have a wonderfully toasted, gorgeous, crumble extravaganza. And we also have some of this most delicious beef brisket, which somehow is transformed into a new container. Don't worry about that. And uh, it is time to plate. So, hopefully you can see exactly how tender and delicious this beef brisket has come up. So tender, I will take two forks and simply tear that apart into that succulent, juicy brisket, which is an absolute treat. I know what I'm having for dinner tonight, guys. And uh, I hope this has inspired you to go and have some of this for dinner as soon as you can get back to the market. This um, is absolutely falling apart, super tender, super juicy, it smells delightful. And you can see that there's still quite a bit of, uh, still quite a bit of that really nice liquid in the bottom. And that, uh, if you like, that can be reduced down or even blended up to make a really nice sauce that can go over top. We already have a wonderful sauce however we have these amazing mushrooms that's going to pop on top making sure that we get a little bit of everything so nice a little bit of that uh, mushroom bernoisette that we prepared earlier and then last but not least the fantastic wild garlic salsa verde to just drizzle over on top and that there, in my opinion, is a very nice dinner.
We have braised beef brisket, sautéed wonderful local mushrooms, and a wild garlic salsa verde. It does not get a lot better than that. Seasonal food at its best. Amazing, thank you so much. Yum, yum. And um, with the crumble, if you feel like being a little bit fancy, then you might get a spoon, put it into your uh, pot of hot water, and you might get a little bit of cream. Scoop it through, and then pop a little cream on top. Make a nice little quenelle, so you can impress all of your friends with your excellent chefly skills. And, uh, and there we are. And we have made it to the end with only three minutes over time, which is not, not too bad. So, um, look, thank you so much for, um, for sticking around and, um, and being part of this local food cooking workshop. Thank you to our wonderful three local legends, uh, Cheryl, Nick, and Ali. You guys are amazing. Thank you so much for all of the work that you do uh, to create a better food system, feeding the masses while looking after the natural environment. We, uh, we salute you. You are amazing. Um, quick quick note as well, so this, this workshop was as part of uh, We Eat Local and so for this collaboration We Eat Local is, has an app and uh, we've actually uploaded all of the London farmers markets onto the app. So if you download the app We Eat Local you can open it up and it shows a map of London with all of the London farmers markets locations. You can then click through, see what producers are there you can click to a profile about those producers and find out more information about them. You can see exactly how far food has traveled between the two points and um, get a real bit of a story about local food and the producers that are, that are feeding you. So um, I recommend jumping on. It's a great tool if you're out and about and you want to find some local food and they're not near your, your regular market, open it up and you can see what's around you. Um, but uh, yeah, that's my last little plug. Did, um, did any of our wonderful local legends want to, want to say anything else or if there's any last questions from the group we would um, love to hear from you, just pop it into the, into the chat just box. Just something useful to add, Nick, correct me if I'm wrong, but everyone who's like dying to buy meat from Nick this weekend, I've got a feeling by the time he's not actually in market this weekend, but he will be back the week after. I'm obviously in the, in the, the purposes of, um, uh, sorry, can't what the word is. We do have lots of other great farms as well. <laughs> yeah. Mm. No, very good. Uh, Ali, any, any last words for the group? Um, I want to eat it, I think. <laughs> I have to go home and start making it. It looks really... It looks amazing. It's really, really it delicious. Look, it yeah. does look nice. Uh, it's nice to have inspiration, something different to what I've... I've never made a crumble like that with the combination of pear and rhubarb and, mm. um, yeah just it's really nice to watch thank you thank well, you for having me you were the inspiration for that so thank you oh. so much. <laughs> thank you <laughs> and uh nick any wise parting parting words I'm, I'm just looking forward to your book coming out at christmas <laughs> <laughs> yeah. there we go <laughs> next time we'll have to um we'll have to do a collaboration so we can cook somewhere together yeah i'll tell you what it doesn't look that that kitchen doesn't look big enough for you and me <laughs> <laughs> it is, uh, it's, it's snug, but it's workable. I'd, I'd, do you know one day I'd actually love to do that? No, that sounds great. Let's do it. All right. Well, thank you again, everyone, for, uh, for coming along and, um, and supporting this local food system. Thank you for attending the farmers markets, contributing um, and, uh, and making this, these uh, local producers possible through your, through your patronage and through your support. Um, I'll follow up tomorrow with an email uh, with a bit of a feedback survey and, of course, the recipe so you can um, cook this food. Uh, but, uh, look, thank you so much, and I hope you enjoy uh, the rest of your evening. Thanks for making it happen, Ben. Pleasure. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks guys. Bye. 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 Cheers.